And um, as we journey during the season of Lent, um, studying the Gospel of Luke, I hope you realize by now, if you've been following this reading, how wonderfully vivid and expressive the stories are in the Gospel of Luke, stories that tell us of the truth of Jesus Christ. Um, as Jane had said, as we get farther into the readings, the readings, daily readings, become get longer. So uh, the readings from past week, there's a huge, rich uh, array of stories and teachings, and I get to pick one of those to preach on in my sermon. So it, it, you know, it encompasses a great many stories and teachings, yet the, the, the one I want to focus on today is the story of a centurion whose servant is dying. Now, a centurion was a Roman soldier, a military officer, uh, a, a commander of a military unit of about 80 men. They were known to be tough. They were known to be mean. They carried a vine staff, which they used to direct drills and maneuvers with the truce, but they also used it to lash out discipline, whether it was with their soldiers, the subordinate soldiers, with Roman citizens, or even Jewish constituents. However, the centurion in this story is a bit different little different in a rather unexpected way so so let's read about him let's hear about him a centurion had a servant who was very important to him but the servant was ill and about to die when the centurion heard about Jesus he sent some Jewish elders to Jesus to ask him to come and heal his servant when they came to Jesus they earnestly pleaded with Jesus he deserves to have you do this for him they said he, he loves our people he built our synagogue for us Jesus went with them. He had almost reached the house when the centurion sent friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't be bothered. I don't deserve to have you come into my, into, under my roof. In fact, I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. I am also a man appointed under authority with soldiers under me say, uh, under me, I say to one, go, he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and the servant does it. When Jesus heard these words, he was impressed with the centurion. He turned to the crowd following him and said, I tell you, even in Israel, I haven't found faith like this. When the centurion's friends returned to his house, they found the servant restored to health. This is a wonderful story. Here's a Roman military officer one powerful with great authority whose servant becomes gravely ill and he has compassion for him. Maybe it's because he's had the servant for a long time and it's just like family to him. But it's unusual for this centurion to have compassion for a lowly servant. This man needs help. Yet here's a man, great authority, great power in the area that all he has to do is say jump and people say how far? All he has to do is say, do this, and it's done. No questions asked. He tells one to go, another to come, and they drop what they're doing. It's a done deal. But now he faces a situation where he has no control, where he has, he has no authority. He, he, he's helpless. He's unable to come to the aid of his servant. Yet he knows the one person who can help a lowly rabbi from Nazareth who's absolutely no authority, no hierarchy or status in their culture, one who is really subject to the centurion and has to report to him, has to obey everything the centurion commands, this man named Jesus. So what does this high and mighty soldier do in this case? He humbles himself and he goes to find Jesus. Well, he... If you read this, looked at the script, he doesn't look for Jesus himself. He, he asked some Jewish elders of the temple to bring him home to, to his home. Jesus followed them to the house of the centurion. However, when Jesus gets near the house, the soldier sends friends out to stop Jesus and say, you know, why did they stop? Because this, you know, this soldier of great authority has said, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and the servant is healed. And this, here's a centurion with great clout, knows the one, and he knows the one who is truly worthy, and he, he trusts that Jesus can heal his servant without stepping even foot into his house. 
and he was healed. You know, this is a great uh, story. A story of someone who shows up out of nowhere, uh, but somehow has great trust in Jesus. We don't even know his name. We don't even know how he knows Jesus. And yet he puts his whole trust in him. And what was Jesus' response? I tell you, even in Israel, I haven't found faith like this. Jesus credits him with great faith. But he's a Roman citizen, a Gentile, a non-Jew, someone who is really kind of well off. Isn't, isn't Jesus supposed to chastise people like that? That they should live a more righteous life? And here he's praising the man for having great faith. You know, there's only one other instance in, in the Bible where Jesus declares that someone has great faith. It's not a religious leader. It's not a disciple. He says it to a Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, 22 through 28. Let's read that story. A Canaanite woman from, from these territories came out and shouted, Show me mercy, son of David. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. But he didn't respond to her at all. His disciples came and urged him, Send her away. She keeps shouting out after us. And Jesus replied, I've been sent only to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. He replied, it is not good to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat crumbs that fall off their master's table. And Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. It will be just as you wish. And right then, her daughter was healed. So it must be noted that Canaanites were considered wicked. They were idol worshipers. They were considered wicked, evil people by, by the, the Hebrew people. So this woman comes to Jesus. Her daughter's demon-possessed. And he wants Jesus to heal her. Well, if you look through that, the Jesus, Jesus pushes back a little. And that, that can only be described as kind of Jesus playing to the crowd to make a point. To get his point across, he pushes back. And first of all, it says, no, I'm not going to do it. But the woman is extremely persistent until Jesus acknowledges her. Until he finally says, woman, you have great faith. It will be just as you wish. And right then, her daughter was healed. These are stories of great faith from unexpected sources, from unexpected characters. And that's kind of the main story of here, the point of this story in the Gospel of Luke. Here's, here's a person of great faith that trusted in Jesus. But I think there's another angle here in this story that we need to look at. It's interesting to observe the actions of the Jewish elders in this story. You remember the centurion goes out and he, he goes to the Jewish elders first and says, I, I, I asked him to bring Jesus to him. And the elders panic. They're frantic. A powerful centurion has come to, asking, uh, to us asking for you. You must obey what he says. I'm sure there's kind of a mixture of fear and, and excessive submissiveness in their actions. So they, they try to persuade Jesus. They try to flatter him. He deserves to have you do this for him. He loves our people, and he built our synagogue for us. Nowhere in that statement is an ounce of compassion for the servant or the centurion. That was not their motive. Only that they, there's this powerful person who wants to come to see Jesus, to visit Jesus. And so you must do this. you got to do this, Jesus. You should feel honored and humbled. Here is a mighty Roman centurion that wants to see you. Welcome him. Yet as we see at the end of the story, the tables are turned. It is the centurion who is humbled by Jesus. He does not even feel worthy to have Jesus come into his house. And then Jesus proclaims that he is one that has great faith. I'm sure the Jewish elders in the story were, were, were flustered. He, he has great faith. He's a Roman centurion. He's one of the bad guys. Centurions, they're evil. They're bullies. Why does he have great faith? I don't know if you've ever watched uh, some of those old Western movies from the 20s and the 30s or 30s and 40s. Now, some of you probably saw them when they first came out, but I won't ask for a, a show of hands on that. One of the uh, attributes of these movies is that you could tell fairly quickly who the bad guys were and who the good guys were. You didn't have to go through this plot development or plot story or character development. How could you tell who the bad guys are and who the good guys were? Simple. 
what hat they wore. There you go. If you had a white hat on, he was a good guy. If you had a black hat on, he was a bad guy. So, uh, you know, pretty much any Western you saw had this, had this rule in it. And even recently, there was an HBO series that came out about five or six years ago called Westworld. You ever see that? It's actually based on a movie back in the 70s, a great movie. It's centered on a fictional, technologically advanced, Wild West-themed amusement park where high-paying guests could indulge in fantasy of being in the Old West. When you arrived, you had a choice between being a good guy and a bad guy. And if you chose to be a good guy, they gave you a white hat. If they chose to be a bad guy, they gave you a black hat. See, that rule applied even in that show as well. So that hat rule is not played out in movies today. And I'm kind of glad it doesn't. I always feel like that was kind of racist, you know, saying that white is good and black is bad. So uh, I didn't like that at all. But in our culture today, we are still prone to assign which groups are the good guys and which groups are the bad guys and affix the appropriate hat onto them. You know, it's e much easier to put labels on people, to figure people out on groups of people and kind of base our relationships and responses to them with these, with in this manner, rather than trying to take the time to get to know them, their character, who they are, their personalities. We just put labels on them. There is a, a Nigerian best-selling author who has a, a, a name as a mouthful, Kamamande Adichie. And she is a, She's a narrator of probably one of the most observed, most watched TED Talks in history. Now, if you're not familiar with the TED Talk, they're popular videos from expert speakers and either from business or science or technology or education or creativity. And Adichie's talk was entitled, The Danger of a Single Story. And she coined this phrase, single story, and speaks of the perils of when we think like that. She defines a single story as when we describe the overly simplistic and sometimes false perceptions we form about individuals, groups, and countries. As she's Nigerian, she uses her own experience for coming to the United States as a college student to, to explain this phrase. And before you create your own stereotypes about, well, gosh, I wonder what college you went to. It was a much esteemed university in New England, okay? It was... You know, she, he, when she met her roommate, her roommate says, oh my gosh, you speak English so perfectly. Your English is so good. Where did you learn to speak English so well? Well, in Nigeria, Nigeria English is the official language. So. And, and she, she asked if, can I listen to your tribal music? And was very flustered when she produced a tape of Mariah Carey. So... <laughs> She also assumed that because she came from Africa, she did not know how to operate a stove. So very meticulously, she showed her, this is how you operate this stove. Chimamanda then described how her roommate had felt sorry for her before she even met her. Uh, just because of the single story that she had seen about the catastrophes and pity and not the blessed and happy sides of being African. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. I, I had a similar experience to this when I went off to seminary in Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. I, I was single at the time, and I lived in the dorm, and I was talking to my uncle on the phone, and I said, I told him, you know this guy in the, on the floor is from Kenya. He goes, oh, those Kenyans, they like to walk around barefoot. They like to run everywhere they go, don't they? Yeah, they'll be barefoot all the time. So his only association with Kenyans was the marathon runners in the Olympics, who most of them were barefoot. Of course, they ran all the time. Uh, he was very disappointed when I told him that Kenya living on my dorm floor, you know, he had a car and some very nice shoes to go along with it. So. As Adichie says, single stories can have significant negative impact. They can rob people of their dignity and emphasize how we are different rather than how we are similar. The single story is, is, is what we, the same story gets told over and over again about a people or a place we do not know firsthand. So we create a story about them. 
Adichie explains that the danger of the single story is that it creates stereotypes. And not that these stereotypes are totally untrue, but they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. We all as fallible human beings can so easily fall into that trap. Just as the Jewish elders were think, just thinking in the scripture passage, cannot believe that a Roman centurion would have such great faith and that a Roman centurion would have such compassion for a lowly servant. That's just not who they are. They're the bad guys. Do you ever think back about regret you had in your life? I, 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 I try not to do so. I don't, don't have, uh, uh, I haven't lived a very blessed life. I don't think about the regrets, but if there's one thing I'd want to do over, have a do over, is that I wish in our younger days I hadn't fallen in this trap of the single story narratives. You know, I don't know if it's the way I was raised or because I was extremely shy at that time, but when I was growing up, I had distinct categories of who the good guys are and who the bad guys. And I hung around the good guys and I stayed away from the bad guys. I, I kind of really sheltered myself from developing relationships and getting to know others. I, I didn't take the opportunity to get to know anyone who I considered different from me, different races, different cultures, different color, different faith. And, and it wasn't just these differences either. Uh, you know, it, it, I wasn't much of an athlete, so I had a thing against football players too, so I stayed away from them. Uh, also, anyone who went to different grade school than I did, anybody who was not college bound, they were less than me. Those who were in, weren't in the band, those were the others. You know, I dished out the label bad guys very liberally and pretty much avoided them. And that's one of my big regrets in life. I, I wish I had a do-over in this case. You know, I think back in all the friends that I missed out on, all the relationships I could have developed, all I could have learned from the, uh, these, these other people. I could have had more, many, many more precious memories of my school days, but I feel like I was in chains bound by the stereotypes I had created for myself. And I cannot say that I'm truly free of all this, but I have become, when I become closer to Christ in my faith walk, I realize the dangers of this thinking. That when we resort to the single story thinking that we feel like we know it all, we tend to think of ourselves more highly than those other people. You know, remember the prayer of the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18, who said, at least I'm not like those tax collectors. Our prayers become like that. Also, if we claim to know people by their single story, we got, to, we got them figured out that we deceivingly assume we know their motives. Well, they're, they're that type of person, so we know how they operate. And we'll be quick to detect minor faults in us while being blind, excuse me, even, excuse me, I said that backward. We will detect minor faults in others while being blind to our grave sins. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? We cut ourselves from community. The richness of blessing of being in a community with others, bearing each other's burdens, growing in love and grace of Jesus Christ together and serving together. We, we cut ourselves from learning new insight, different cultures and backgrounds, different outlooks on life. Our world becomes so small when we do this. And finally, I want to say we must avoid these type of stereotype thinking just because Jesus told us to. Love one another, even those who you think are your enemies. It is dangerous and wrong when we create a single story that becomes the only story for a certain group of people. But I say there's one exception. There's one exception. One story that applies to all humankind from Galatians chapter 3 26 through 28 you are all God's children through faith in Jesus Christ all of you who are baptized uh, into Christ have closed yourself with Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free nor is there male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus we have one story that we all share we are God's children we are all God's children. So I want you to, during this prayer time, for the next few minutes, uh, I want you to think about 
uh, how this how this story of the single story have touched you and how it's affected you in your life and how still it is affecting you. The notion of relegating groups of people to a single story to define them. Where in your life have you unfairly put labels on certain people and said, they're the bad guys? Have that judgmental spirit marginalize people. Let's have a time of quiet reflection to reflect on where we have been in that in this story. Now, as we reflect on these people, now change, the, turn the table, see them as children of God. Almighty Father, bless us with the gift of new awareness to have fresh eyes to see and to have ears to hear. Renew our love for you that it may be richer, deeper, more open, and a more constant presence in our lives. May we walk in your way, accepting all people as children of God, so that peace and justice become a reality for everybody in our world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.